Today, I'm going to be solving the 2015 Mixed Mathematics A paper for undergraduate students. Section 1, number 1. First of all, let's factorize this expression. In order to draw a graph, figure out the roots or where this function crosses the x-axis. So the graph should look something like this. And 5 over 2 is, of course, 2.5. x equals 1 should be to the left of the vertex here, somewhere here, I guess. So the minimum value would be the y value at the vertex and the maximum value would be somewhere around here, where x equals 4. When x is 4, the maximum value is 12. And what is the midpoint between 0 and 5 over 2? It's of course 5 over 4, so let's substitute 5 over 4 into this expression. So the minimum value is minus 25 over 8. Number 2. There are only three outcomes. The first outcome is that A gets more points than B, and the second outcome is that A gets less points than B, and the third outcome is that A gets the same points as B. So if you add these probabilities together, they should add up to 1. Another thing to note is that, assuming that the coin is fair, the probability of A winning and the probability of B winning must be the same. So we can rewrite this equation as 2 times the probability of A winning plus the probability of a draw equal 1. By rearranging the terms of this equation, we get... So all we have to do is to find the probability of A getting the same point or scores as B. A and B get the same scores when they both get 0 points or... They both get 1 point or they both get 2 points or they both get 3 points. The probability of A getting 3 tails is 1 over 8, and the probability of B also getting 3 tails, 1 over 8. The same can be said about the probability of them getting 3 heads. And the probability of them getting 1 head and 2 tails is 3 over 8 times 3 over 8, and similarly, 3 over 8 times 3 over 8. 64, 20, 5 over 16. And let's substitute this result into this expression here. And I forgot to add the equal sign here. And this is the final answer. Number 3. In order to add these two fractions together, we need to do a little trick. And let's substitute these values. Let's calculate the denominator first. a plus b times a minus b is a squared minus b squared. 5 minus 3, which is 2. And as for these two terms on the numerator, these two terms will cancel each other. So 10 plus 6, 16. So the final answer is 8. Number 4. We have a proposition that says x is not 0 and y is not 0. So what does this proposition mean? Both x and y 
are not zero. In order to find the negation of this proposition, we have to think about what makes this proposition false. This proposition is false when either x is zero or y is zero. Number five. The question says that there are two circles that are tangent to the y-axis, and these two circles intersect each other, and let the radii of these two circles be a and b, we need to figure out the product of the two radii. And that's all the information that we are given, and what can we infer from that information? The line that goes through these two points of intersection has a slope of 45 degrees, because it goes one unit to the right and one unit upwards. This line intersects the y-axis at 0, 0,2. And when two circles are both tangent to the same line, the distance here and the distance here must be equal. And what else do we know? We also know that the line that goes through the centers of these two circles is perpendicular to this line here. And because the angle of this blue line was 45 degrees, and based on these facts, we know that the angle here is also 45 degrees, and when two circles are tangent to the same line, there has to exist another line of tangency. And this red line is the angle bisector of these two tangent lines. So the angle here is also 45 degrees, which means that the two lines of tangency are perpendicular to each other. So let's redraw the graph. Well, I can't really say that it looks any better than the original graph, but this is at least more accurate. Using the Pythagorean theorem, we know that the distance between these two points is root 2, and so are the distances between these two points and these two points. When these two segments are equal in length, we can infer that the first point comes directly below the point of tangency here, and the other point has the same y-coordinate as the other point of tangency here. And the intersection of these two lines is the center of the circle. So given that the length of this segment is root 2, we know that the radius of the smaller circle is 1. And because the length of this segment is also 1, we can deduce the coordinates of the points of tangency. 0, 4, 1, 5. And finally, we can figure out the distance between these two points, which is 2. And remember that this segment and this segment must be equal. So this is also 2. So, the coordinates of this point of tangency must be 0, 0. This means that the radius of the bigger circle is 5. A times B is 1 times 5, which is just 5. This is the final answer. Number 6. We have an equation that includes two absolute value expressions and we need to find the minimum and the maximum values of x. We need to find the boundaries beyond which these expressions become negative. So let this expression be equal to 0, and let's solve this equation for x. Now we know that if x is less than a half, this expression becomes negative. So anything past this point all the way up to negative infinity, and let's move on to the second expression. Similarly, anything bigger than 2, all the way up to positive infinity. And finally, we have an interval between 1 half and 2. And we need to check for each of these three intervals. If the value of x was in this interval, then the value of this expression would be negative. So we need to put a negative sign before it. And then we can convert the absolute value sign into the normal brackets. If the value of x was between these two values, this expression 
would also become negative because 1 over 2 is smaller than 2. So again, you need to put a minus before the bracket. And let's solve this equation. Now, we have a possible answer, but we need to make sure that this value lies between these two values. And indeed it does. And let's check the second interval. Between these two values, the first expression will be positive, so there's no need to put a minus before the brackets. But the second expression will be negative, when the value of x is less than 2. Is x equals 1 included in this interval? Yes, it is. So x equals 1 is another solution. And finally, let's check the third interval. When x is greater than 2, both of these expressions become positive, so we don't need to add any negative signs. 5 over 3 is 1.6. 5 over 3 is outside this interval, which means that this is not a solution. So this is the minimum value of x, and this is the maximum value of x. Number 7. w is a complex number, we need to calculate the value of w raised to the fifth power. Let's calculate the denominator first, 32, and in order to expand the expression on the numerator, we can use the binomial theorem, and this is the formula that you need to know. So let's do some tedious calculations. Let's calculate the first term, and the second term, the third term, the fourth term, the fifth term, and the final term. Remember that this expression means n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial. So the first term is 1, 5 factorial over 1 factorial times 4 factorial, which is 5. So the final answer is 1 half minus root 3 over 2i. Number 8. The first term of the sequence is 0. Using this information, we can figure out the second term. The second term minus the first term is going to be 2 times 1, because n is equal to 1 in this case. Since the first term is 0, we know that the second term is 2, and the difference is 2 times 1. And based on this pattern, the next term must be 2 times 2, 2 plus 4, 6, 2 times 3, so 6 plus 6 is 12, 2 times 4, which is 8, and 12 plus 8 is 20, and so on. And in this question, what we need to do is to find the general term, that is the nth term. When n is equal to 1, a sub 1 must be 0. When n equals 2, a sub 2 must be 2. And I hope you can see the pattern. That is, 1 times 2 is 2, 2 times 3 is 6, 3 times 4 is 12, 4 times 5 is 20. And of course, 0 times 1 is 0. So the general term must be the current term times the previous term. And this should be the answer. For question 1, we need to express the length of the arcs AB, BC, and CA in terms of the angles ABC and the radius R. And let's draw a bigger diagram. BCA is C, and you should know that the angle AOB is 2C. And how do you calculate the length of the arc? The length of 
AB, 2 times the radius times pi times 2C over 360 degrees. And 360 degrees is 2 pi. So we can get rid of 2 and pi. And we are left with 2CR. Similarly, the length of the arc BC must be 2AR and CA must be 2BR. Let this triangle be called AOB and the angle between them 2C based on this triangle here. The area of triangle AOB is 1 over 2 times r squared times sine 2c. Because triangle ABC is the sum of the three triangles, AOB plus BOC plus AOC, we know that the only difference between them is going to be the angle here. So sine 2a plus sine 2b plus sine 2c and this should be the answer for number 2. We are given the values of a, b, c and r and we need to find the lengths of the sides a, b, b, c and c, a. And let's start with the side a, b. a, o and b, o are both 1 because the radius is 1 and the angle here is 2c 2c must be 90 degrees. Using the Pythagorean theorem, we know that AB is root 2. And let's move on to BC. The angle here must be 2A, which is 150 degrees. In this case, we cannot use the Pythagorean theorem. Instead, we have to use the cosine rule. BC is equal to the root of 1 squared plus 1 squared minus 2 times 1 times 1 times cosine 150 degrees. And cosine 150 degrees is minus root 3 over 2. Therefore, BC must be root 2 plus root 3. And the final part, CA. The angle AOB is 2B, which is 120 degrees. Using the cosine rule, CA is root 2 minus 2 cosine 120 degrees. Cosine 120 degrees is minus 1 half. So CA is root 3. And this is the complete answer. Section 3 which is the final section. We need to find the value of the constant a and the function f of x. What this part of the equation is doing is finding the area under a line or a curve. Since we don't have that much information to play with, let's say that we're trying to find the area between a and a, which of course should be zero. So the right hand side of the equation must equal 0. So 3a squared plus a plus 8 times a plus 4 is 0. And let's factorize inside the brackets. So a must be minus 1. And this becomes positive 7. Next, we need to find f of x. Let's find the derivative of this expression here. 3 times 2, 6, and x plus 7. And finally, we need to find the minimum of the integral. In order to find the minimum of this integral, we need to use its derivative, f of x. And let f of x be equal to 0. And let's substitute this value into this expression. The final answer is minus 1 over 12. And this is the end of this exam paper. See you next time.